Welcome to the lecture on the famous FLP result. So the FLP result, the credit goes to three people. And I'll tell you in a second what the result is. But first, some honor is due to the people who have arguably discovered the most important result in distributed systems. So the people who deserve the credit are Michael Fisher. So that explains the F, Nancy Lynch for L and Michael S. Patterson for P. So the FLP result basically uh, says that to solve the consensus problem in a distributed setting, even if we have one faulty process, it is not possible. So the paper is titled Impossibility. of distributed consensus with one faulty process. So we, I will discuss in a second what exactly distributed consensus is and why exactly are we so bothered about it. So let me first discuss what is consensus and then what is distributed consensus. So consensus basically means that there are a set of processes and each process proposes a value. So let's say that they propose an integer. So one process, one of these circles which is a process, one of them proposes 4, then 9, let's say 3, 2 and 5. So consensus basically says it has two properties. So the first property would be let's say, one among the proposed values Right. So, one value among all the proposed values is chosen. So, it cannot be a separate value. Okay. So, one among them is chosen. That is, and the second one is that everybody agrees. So, this can be thought of as an agreement problem as well. Something that everybody agrees. All right. So, why is this problem so important? Well, the problem is important basically because if we consider each process to be a distributed process, and we consider all of this to be a distributed system, then what it basically means is that we want to make a set of distributed processes agree on some common thing, on something of common interest. And we'll in a second see what they are, but basically it's an agreement problem where there is no centralized entity. All that we can do is we can send messages between processes the way that we have been doing. And we also know that uh, messages may get delayed and that too get delayed indefinitely for a very long time. So in such a noisy environment, we want to ensure that consensus holds, which means one among the proposed values is chosen and everybody agrees. So why is this such a big deal? So let us look at two examples of why this is such a big deal. So let's go back to one of our problems, which was leader election. So in leader election, what were we doing? We had a set of nodes. Each node said that it is the leader or at least wanted to be the leader. Finally, we had an election between them basically by sending messages between the nodes. And ultimately, one node was chosen as the leader. And everybody else agreed that this node should be their leader. So this is in a sense exactly the consensus problem that one among the proposed values is chosen and everybody agrees. So as you can see there is complete agreement. Right? So agreement is there. No doubt. Furthermore, one among the values is chosen and leader election is definitely an instance, a specialization of the general consensus problem. So let me give another example. So let's say that you know I am the user 
and I make a credit card transaction to buy an airline ticket. So that automatically involves the bank as well. That automatically involves the travel agency, the site that I'm using to buy the ticket. And that involves the airline as well. All right. So the airline as well is involved. So the point is that all of them, all these five entities need to agree on one thing. Either they agree to issue the ticket, all five of them. This basically means that if my money is deducted, then the ticket should be issued and I should have the ticket with me. It should never be the case that money has been deducted from my bank account or my credit card account, but my ticket is not there with me. That should not happen. And furthermore, it should also not be the case that all five of these entities, which means me, the credit card, the bank, the travel agency and the airline, all five of us agree that I should be given the ticket, but ultimately it's not issued. That is also not allowed because a consensus is to choose one value among the set of proposed values. All right, you can't parachute a value from somewhere else. So, which means that, you know, a broad agreement, a consensus like agreement is required. So, these are also called transaction commit systems, which we will study later, which form the core technology of most banking, finance, almost everything to do with distributed systems. These, uh, this basic transaction processing system, even in large databases is required. Again, what is the core problem? The core problem is a consensus problem. So similarly, it has been identified that a large number of problems in distributed systems and concurrent systems are essentially specializations of the mother problem, which is the consensus problem. As a result, the consensus problem has a very special place. Now, when we want to achieve a consensus, some sort of an agreement in a real world scenario, we will have faults in the sense we might have network links that die. We might have nodes that die. We might have indefinite delays or we just might have slow machines. We just might have a machine which for some reason is congested, is taking too long to reply. So in such a scenario, the question is, can we achieve consensus? Can we achieve an agreement? Can nodes decide on something? So the answer is, it's an unfortunate answer, but the thing is, even if you have one faulty process, so we'll formally define what a faulty process is. But the idea is that even if you have one faulty process, the answer is no. It is not possible. And this has, this is the famous FLP result, which is kind of the underpinning of most consensus systems as of today. And the sad part is that since it is not doable, nevertheless, a lot is done to kind of get close, which we will discuss in subsequent lectures. But we are starting from this somber note over here. So given the fact that we have described the consensus problem, let us now describe our system model that under what kind of assumptions are we trying to solve the consensus problem. So of course, we assume that we have n processes. Between any pair of processes, so any pair of processes can communicate. So there is a channel between them. So we do ass assume reliable message delivery in the sense messages are de delivered correctly. Their contents are not modified. But it is just that messages may get indefinitely delayed. Nevertheless, no message is ever dropped. I mean, unless the node is faulty. So, we will come to that. So, the issue is that we have in our system, among the processes, we have regular processes, normal processes or non-faulty processes. So, non-faulty process, what it can do is that it can take an infinite number of steps in the sense that as long as messages keep coming, it can process them. As compared to that, a faulty process, 
can take a finite number of steps and then it will simply stop responding all right so you can say that it is slow or it is dead so we have no way of differentiating so we cannot differentiate between a slow process and a, between a slow and a failed process a process which has failed so it is not possible for us to differentiate between them so as far as we are concerned the process is slow but whether it is slow or whether it has actually failed that we don't know all right so given the fact that we have this and then of course we have a channel and another thing about the channel the noc is that we can have out of order delivery in the sense that we don't have the fifo property so we have out of order delivery of messages in the sense that if one message was sent it could be delayed for a long time so so that assumption uh, is something that we make so these are standard assumptions where we have n processes and we have faulty processes but you know at max one at the most let's call it at max one faulty process the rest being non faulty we do have reliable message delivery in the sense messages are not corrupted right it is just that they can get delayed and for a certain process the faulty one we can't say that it is slow or it is dead or something and the same holds for others as well that there is no time base so we cannot say if a process is just slow or slow to respond or dead or you know it's not possible for us to say so given that we have that we should now look at the process model so the process model in a distributed system looks something like this so every process in a distributed system gets a set of inputs all right and then it produces outputs all right so it has an internal state so as far as we are concerned what the process basically does is, is it is kind of like a finite state machine so the finite state machine essentially takes in a message changes the internal state and then in response it can send messages to a few of few other nodes right and so the outputs are basically output messages that are sent to other nodes so then the process goes back to sleep so it's basically a finite state message sorry a finite state machine that is woken up by a message in response the internal state changes and other messages are sent out to other processes so that is basically the model that we have and then of course we define the notion of a step in such a process so the notion of a step basically means that we can either receive a message from the network in a single step or we can we can send an arbitrary number of messages so we can receive a message and it's assumed that we instantaneously update the state or we can send messages okay so messages can be sent so when messages are being sent the atomic broadcast capability is assumed so the atomic broadcast basically says that if one non faulty process receives the message then all non faulty processes will ultimately receive the message all right it is just that we are talking of eventual delivery of the messages and we are not really saying that they will be delivered by this time so messages so messages needless to say can be delayed right so they can be delayed for sure okay and furthermore these delays also can be arbitrarily long and th and these can cause the entire algorithm to wait indefinitely in the sense wait for a very long period all right
So given the fact that we have seen this, where message delivery times and even node response times are, uh, are not uh, deterministic, are not bounded, here, as, as I said, out of n processes, one of them will be faulty. So faulty basically means that within the scope of the algorithm, or let's say in, in the protocol for all possible inputs, it will only take a finite number of steps. And at one point, it will stop. It will just not take steps. To take steps basically means either receiving a message or sending a message. So, so receiving a message automatically includes processing it and changing the internal state. So th that's the reason I'm not talking about changing the internal state as a separate step. But essentially, the step is receiving a message from the network from some other node and sending messages. So both of these things might get delayed. So that's the reason a node may, may appear to be un unresponsive to the, uh, to the rest of the system. So given that that is happening, let us now look at our consensus protocol. All right. So in the consensus protocol, for every process, this is a model that we assume. So we assume that its input is a single bit register, XP. So the single bit input can either be 0 or 1, which pretty much corresponds to the value that is being proposed. So if the value that is being proposed is 0, this could be 0 or it could be 1. Then of course we have some internal state which can be as much as you want. And then there is an output. So in this case, so this output is a final output. It's not the messages that we send. So the final output is what we decided. Right? So this is essentially a process as a part of the consensus algorithm, what it does, it takes in an input, sends as many messages as you want. Finally, the output has three possible values. The first one being the most interesting. So B means undecided. Okay. So undecided means that I have not decided on 0 or 1. So as far as I am concerned, the consensus has not been reached. And 0 or 1 are the regular 0 and 1. They mean that a consensus has been reached. So what our aim will be or what we want to show that if there is one faulty process, which takes a finite number of steps the way that we have defined it and then appears to fail, the all the processes, at least the non-faulty ones, they will appear to be undecided. In the sense, they will not be able to make a decision. So what we further say is that we need not, uh, we, so, so also the other thing is this is a write once register in the sense that we cannot update its value, all right. So now given this process model where we know what the inputs are and what the possible outputs are, let us look at how exactly processes will communicate. So processes will communicate by sending two kinds of messages between them. One is send p comma m. So in this case, p is a process, is a process ID rather, and m is a message. All right. And similarly, we have receive p. That is the other function that processes can call. So this basically means that we receive a message from process P. So again, P is the process ID. So these are the two basic functions that processes will call. And then let's say that after receiving, we get what's called an event. So an event is basically from a given process and a message. So, so it's basically a process ID and a message pair. So this event is applied to the internal state of the process. Based on this, the internal state changes to a new internal state. All right. And furthermore, this can lead to messages being actually sent. All right. So given that we have seen this, we are now in a position to define something called the configuration. And the configuration is a key point in our algorithm. So it's one of the most important inputs that we will use. So configuration is basically a configuration of the entire system 
and what the configuration essentially contains is that it contains the following so it essentially contains all the outputs a union of the internal state of the system right for all the processes so the internal states and along with that all the messages in flight so basically all the messages so this to us is is a configuration and as we have seen every process has an input has an output and an internal state so if i just take a union of this across all the processes so that would include their outputs if they have decided something or not their internal st states and whatever messages that are currently in flight that are yet to be delivered if we look at that we will call this a configuration all right so every time a certain event and so event is the same as essentially a message with the process id along with it every time that this is appeared this is applied to a node which means a node this message is sent to a node the node will of course update its internal state and send messages and this event will also cause the configuration to change the global configuration to change all right the way that we have defined it so when i look at the global configuration what i can say is that the configuration is at, uh, as it is but once let's say a message is sent to it so this message is this event over here then i will apply this event to the existing configuration to get a new configuration c dash so this is known as applying and if i apply several events in the sense i present these events to the processes so then it will be some structure like this that's all right and finally we will have some configuration let's say cn so the important thing is when i'm applying a series of events in sequence we can call this an event schedule this is essentially a finite sequence of events so we can replace this sequence over here with the term sigma and we can just say sigma c is cn all right so basically sigma is essentially a sequence of events that is applied to a configuration to get a new configuration all right so as we can see given a configuration for different combinations of events we can arrive at all kinds of new configurations right so all of these configurations that are arrivable from c are said to be reachable configurations so reachable or alternatively they are also called accessible configurations all right so this basically means that i take one configuration c of the entire system and then i apply all kinds of events to it whatever i can reach is my reachable set or accessible set all right so given that i have this we are pretty much at a position to make uh, to define our final correctness criteria so at this point what we can do is so what have we looked at up till now if i were to summarize we have looked at processes so specifically we have looked at their one bit input the output which also includes the undecided state that's very important the internal state and of course a combination of all of these so essentially an, a, a union of all of these across all the processes which leads to a configuration and the way in which if we can apply events to a configuration it will become another configuration so apply the event sequence sigma to c so it will become some other configuration c dash all right so now we are in a position as i said to be, uh, to provide some definitions that will take us to our final notion of correctness 
so the first thing that i would like to say is that a config is that a configuration c has a has a decision value v if some process has already made its decision so let's say within the configuration there is some process p whose output is already a zero or one it is not undecided and it has finalized the output so finalized the output meaning that is a result of the consensus so if this has been finalized we say that the configuration c has decided and whatever output any one process has decided that will be the decision value of the consensus right of of that configuration as well and clearly multiple processes cannot decide different things all right so now let's use this fact to define what is a, what is called a partially correct execution so a partially correct execution has two properties the first property is that no accessible configuration has more than one decision value which means that if i start from an initial state then no accessible configuration has more than one so this is something that we just said so what we basically said is that look if let's say a configuration has more than one decision value then there is clearly no consensus so that is something that is not allowed so this is property 1 and a second property is like this that let's say if i start from the from an initial configuration then there is some accessible configuration that has decision value 0 and there is some accessible configuration that has decision value 1 all right so this basically means that it is not a fixed match in the sense that when i'm starting i have access some configuration is reachable which is going to decide zero and something is reachable which is deciding one which basically means that i'm starting with an open mind i am not committing myself to any particular outcome i am simply saying that look this is where i start this is my initial value and essentially all configurations are ac are accessible accessible in the sense that a path of events exists that can take me from the initial configuration let's say c to some other configuration let's say cx which decides zero and some other configuration let's say cy which decides one in a sense both are possible so both of these are essentially saying the first one is a clear cut consensus condition that multiple things cannot be decided and the second one is more like a sanity check that it is not a you know it's not like a fixed match so when you begin you start with an open mind that either you can decide zero or you can decide one all right so given that we have this we can extend a partially correct execution to what is called a totally correct execution which is something that we are after so let me write it down so totally correct execution does take in the notion of a faulty process and a non faulty process so as we said a process is faulty if it takes a finite number of steps in the sense it it does something 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 and then abruptly stops right or let's say stops for an infinite amount of time or for a very large amount of time 
such that everybody else concludes that it is virtually dead. So we will see what exactly this means in the context of our proof. But essentially the idea is that for a finite number of times it takes steps and then it basically stops. Whereas a non-faulty process, every time you send it an event, it will take a step in a sense, receive it and then send additional messages or something. So it will take a step the way that we have defined. Furthermore, uh, we are uh, we define the notion of an admissible run. A run is basically a sequence of configurations where we just pre present messages to them and then we move from configuration A to B to C to D and so on. And so a run is the same as let's say the run of a program where you start the protocol and the protocol runs. And the way that the protocol would run is that it would jump from one configuration to the next to the next. As we are generating more events, the nodes are consuming them and changing their internal states. We'll be moving from configuration to configuration. And because messages are being sent and received, so this is called a run. So an admissible run is when basically all non-faulty nodes get the message. All right. Get a message eventually. So of course a message may be delayed. But eventually all non-faulty uh, nodes will get the message. So for them no message is dropped. So this is an admissible run. So what a totally correct protocol is, is that totally correct is essentially partially correct plus little bit more. Totally correct is basically partially correct. Partially correct means that it makes sense in the sense that consensus is achieved as we have seen over here and furthermore we start with an open mind so we don't commit ourselves to one outcome zero or one and furthermore every admissible so this is you know let's say first clause and the second clause is that every admissible run so admissible run is essentially a run of the protocol where all non-faulty nodes will get a message. So for them, no message is dropped. So every admissible run is a deciding run. So what this basically means is that if for every admissible run of the protocol, we finally reach a configuration that decides. Either decides 0 or 1, we don't really care. But finally, we do reach a configuration that decides the outcome, whatever it may be. All right. So in the presence of one faulty process, this is what a totally correct execution to us means that the basic principles of consensus do hold, basic sanity checks hold and furthermore, every admissible run is a deciding run in the sense that every time we run the protocol, we ultimately end up with a decision. So what we would like to prove is that our protocol is not totally correct. In the sense, every ad admissible run is not a deciding run, which means that even if we run it for an infinite number of steps, ultimately we will not be able to decide. So our aim, if you would look at it in this proof, is basically to prove that our protocol is not totally correct. Because if something is totally correct, then it means that it is deciding on every single run. So it is totally decisive. But we want to prove the reverse that our protocol is indecisive. So we want to say that our protocol is not totally correct. That is essentially what we would like to prove. So for this, we will prove a sequence of three lemmas, which will say that look, if you start from an indecisive state, Regardless of how many messages you exchange, you will always have an indecisive state. So in the sense, your protocol, it is possible that for certain runs, regardless of how much you run, you will never be able to make a decision. So you will never be able to compute a consensus, all right, in the presence of one faulty process, which basically means that our protocol is not totally correct. Because in this case, every admissible run 
is not a deciding run. So ultimately, we are not deciding anything. So to prove this, we will essentially divide the proof into three lemmas, lemma 1, lemma 2 and lemma 3. You can take a look at the paper. Right, so, so this is exactly what we are going to do. That we look at two simple lemmas and then a third one. All right. So the first lemma is like this, and it's fairly straightforward. So here is what it says. So what it says is that let us start from some configuration C and apply two schedule of events. So let us apply sigma 1 or let us alternatively apply sigma 2. Okay. So let these lead to configuration C1 and C2 respectively. Furthermore, all the processes that take steps in sigma 1 and all the processes that take steps in sigma 2, let them be mutually disjoint. Or let's say the function p defines all the processes that take steps in sigma 1. So this intersection sigma 2 is actually equal to null. So essentially what it means is sigma 1 works on one set of processes and sigma 2 works on a different set of processes. So if that is the case, then what can be done is that we can apply sigma 2 to C1 and we can apply sigma 1 to C2, they will ultimately reach the same configuration C3. Because as far as C3 is concerned, the relative order of sigma 1 and sigma 2 does not matter because the processes themselves are disjoint. So it does not matter, there is no exchange of information between them. So, so that is the reason. Here, this appears to be commutative in the sense you either apply sigma 1 first and then sigma 2 or you apply sigma 2 first and then sigma 1, it does not matter, we ultimately reach the same point. So this basically means that the processes are disjoint. So disjoint processes in a sense imply commutativity of operations. So the operations commute, they can be replaced. So we will remember this, this is a very important result and we will take it forward. So now let us come to the second lemma which is lemma 2. So prior to describing the lemma, let me describe or let me initiate the definition of one more term. So this is a simple term. So let's let's say that C is a configuration, and let's say from this configuration we can reach a configuration which decides zero, and we can reach a configuration that decides one, in the sense that this is an open-minded configuration. So we call this a bivalent configuration. All right. So this means that starting from here, I can reach either a state that decides 0 or that decides 1. So, this is called bivalent. In comparison, we can define a univalent configuration where regardless of the configuration transitions that you make, it is guaranteed that you will always decide either 0 or 1 in the sense a decision has already been made and the decision is not going to change. So, that is a univalent configuration. So, lemma 2 basically says that any protocol, a bivalent initial configuration exists. Okay, initial configuration exists. All right. So, let us assume to the contrary that this is not the case. So, if this is not the case, what it means that from the definition of partial correctness, all the initial states are either zero valent or one valent. 
All right. So if you don't have a bivalent state, then all so I'm using state and configuration interchangeably. See, it basically means that when you are starting, right? So when you are just starting the protocol, what we said from partial correctness is that it should be possible in some runs to decide zero, in some runs to decide one. In a sense, it should not be a fixed match that we always decide zero or always decide one. So then, of course, there are two ways that this can be interpreted. One way is that we our initial configurations itself are bivalent in the sense depending upon who sends what messages, we can either proceed towards ultimately deciding zero or deciding one. That is one way of looking at it. But let's say that in this case, this is what lemma two is trying to prove that a bivalent configuration exists. But let's assume that it doesn't exist. Then another way of looking at partial correctness is that the initial configurations itself are either zero valent or are one valent. Fair enough. So if initial configurations itself are zero valent and one valent, so this will basically mean, since we are assuming to the contrary and we want to prove by uh, contradiction, this will essentially mean that from partial correctness that all the initial configurations are univalent. And furthermore, there has to be at least one such configuration which decides 0 and at least one such configuration that decides 1. In the sense, all of them cannot be deciding 0 or cannot be deciding 1. So given this, let us look at what an initial configuration is. So when we are starting the protocol, we have not sent any messages, there is no internal state, nothing. So the only, in the, sorry, uh, the only thing that we have in the initial configuration is basically the inputs okay that's the only thing that we have so if we have n processes so we can say that the initial configuration comprises an n input array where the pth entry is xp right so if you recall every process takes a one bit input and this can be the value that it will propose. So basically, if you have n processes, for each process we have a one bit input, and that's and that's all. So that's the only thing we have in our initial configuration. All right. So now let's say that you know let's look at a hypothetical line of all our configurations. So let's say that at one end we have a zero valent configuration initial configuration and on the other side we have a one valent. So what does this basically mean? This basically means that there is a vector associated with this all right of the in initial input values and there is one more vector associated with this of the initial input values. The vectors are not the same and because of this vector the contents of this vector we ultimately decide 0 and because of the contents of this vector we ultimately decide 1. So let us do one thing, let us approach this configuration from this by gradually flipping 1, 1 bit each, right. So then let us say the Hamming distance is k, we need to flip k bits to reach this configuration from this one. So as we keep on flipping bit after bit after bit, ultimately we will reach two configurations where we make the 0 to 1 transition. So let us say that we reach a configuration C0 that is 0 valid. And we reach a configuration C1 that is one valent. And the only difference between C0 and C1 in terms of their input vectors will be a process P, right? And the rest of the bits will be the same. The only difference will be in a given location, let's say for process P. So let's say this has some value and this has a complement of that value. But the rest of the bits will exactly be the same. So if this is the case and there are two such configurations that are essentially one bit apart and basically for process P the inputs are different. So let us use this as a starting point. All right. So what do we have? So from our, so let me again retrace our journey. So the lemma 2 we had to prove that a bivalent initial configuration exists. 
we assume that to the contrary let's assume that it does not exist if it doesn't exist then by partial correctness which holds all our initial configurations are now univalent but by partial correctness some have to decide 0 and some have to decide 1 furthermore what we said is that in the initial state we just have one bit per process so the initial configuration is just a n, is just an n bit vector and as we move from one configuration that is zero valent to a configuration that is one valent we will always arrive at a c0 c1 pair which are essentially neighbors that differ by just one bit for the pth process where c0 is zero valent and c1 is one valent so given the fact that we have come to this point here is what we can do so let us start at c0 and consider an admissible run okay and so let the schedule of events be sigma c0 so which means that from c0 if i apply the set of events sigma i will reach some state let's say cx similarly what i can do is i can take c1 and apply the exact same state of uh, the same set of events but there is something special about this set of events in this set of events process p does not take any steps the way that we have defined so in a sense process p is quiet so as we had discussed a faulty process when the time comes it betrays you so it basically does not take any steps so let's say that process p betrays us and it doesn't take any steps so even though its inputs are different since it doesn't take any steps the fact that its inputs are different in both the initial configuration c0 and c1 it's not visible to other processes so now when we apply a set of transitions which are essentially a set of events are applied but in this set of events p is not taking any steps so regardless of where we start from c0 or c1 we are bound to reach the same finals configuration which is cx primarily because process p was the only difference and in this case it did not take any steps all right so given that we are reaching the same configuration there is a problem this was zero valent this was one valent if this configuration is zero valent then this state cannot be one valent right because if this configuration is deciding zero then this configuration could not be deciding one because once a state is let's say one valent regardless of the transitions that are made right so regardless of whatever transitions we make all reachable configurations will be one valent but that is not happening over here so which basically means that for c0 and c1 which decide different values there can never be a common configuration that is reachable from both but given the fact that we have a common configuration that is reachable from both it essentially indicates that there is a contradiction because this is not possible right so if this decides zero this one has to decide zero but then c1 cannot point to it because c1 would want this to decide to one so there is clearly a contradiction and the contradiction tells us that we will at least have one initial state which is bivalent fair enough lemma prove we are happy so now what we will prove is that we will essentially provide an inductive argument so we have a bivalent initial configuration okay so bivalent basically means that it is open minded in the sense it has not made up its mind whether it is going to decide 0 or 1. All right, so then it's an open minded configuration, it's undecided. So we will now prove that given an initial state is undecided, it is possible that after we apply a set of events, we will still arrive at an undecided state. Again, we apply a set of events, we'll still arrive at an undecided state so on and so forth we can continue till infinity we will always have a state which is undecided which means that our protocol will never be able to make a decision zero or one which is exactly what we set out to prove 
which means that it is not totally correct. This means that every admissible run is not deciding. Or in common man's terms, if we want to solve a problem, it is possible that we might run an infinite number of st steps and still not be able to solve it. So, what will help us in doing this is lemma 3. So, what does lemma 3 say? So, lemma 3 says let C be a bivalent configuration. Furthermore, let us consider an event of the type P, M, which means as an event destined for process P with message M. So, let this be applicable to C. Then let the set B be all the states, all the configurations that are reachable from C without applying E. So, essentially what I do is I apply all the other events, but I do not apply E. So, let B be all the configurations that are reachable from C without applying E. And furthermore, let the set D be all the configurations from B, where I all that I do is I take a configuration here and I just apply E. Right? So, given the fact that E was applicable to C, right, which is the initial configuration. So, then we, we did not apply it, so we apply the rest of the events, so that is okay. So, given that it was originally applicable and of course, let us assume that the message got delayed, which means the event E got delayed, it will still be applicable. So, let us say after that we reach a bunch of states B and we can apply E to any one of them, so we will reach a state called so, we will reach a set of configurations D. So, mind you, C was a single configuration which is bivalent, all right. But B and D are sets, okay. So, B is the set of all configurations that are reachable without applying E. And then I apply E and then apply E to every single configuration of B and then I reach the set D, all right. So, what we, I want to prove is the statement of the lemma is that D contains. A bivalent configuration. That is what I would like to prove. Now, D contains a bivalent configuration. All right. So, again, let us assume to the contrary that this is not the case. So, if this is not the case, what is the Proof by contradiction assumption that D contains only univalent configurations. Fair enough. So, this is what we are setting out to disprove. So, let us say. That given that C is bivalent, so, so we will start from this point, right. So, since C is bi bivalent, let us look at two configurations E0 and E1, where E0 is univalent, it decides 0 and E1 is univalent, it decides 1, all right. So, let us now look at the different cases that are possible and of course E0 and E1 will exist because C is bivalent. So, then E0 and E1 will exist because it would ultimately take you towards two states depending upon the transitions that are applied which are E0 and E1. So, let us consider let us say the case of E0. If E0 is an element of the set B, it means that E has not been applied to it. So, let us do one thing. Let us apply E to it. So, then we will reach let us say a state called D0 which is an element of set D and this follows from definition. Alright, so same holds for let us say the set E1. If E1 is an element of sorry, if E1 is an element of set B in the sense it is reachable without applying E, then all that I do is I apply E to it. 
and then I will reach another state D1, which is an element of D. All right. Fair enough. So now let us consider the other case, which I am taking out some real estate over here and I will write it over here. So let us assume that we reach the state E0 after applying E. So which means from C we come here. Then we reach some configuration, we apply E. So whatever is this configuration is now a member, is, is now a part of D. All right. So, so let us call this configuration as D0. And there after a set of transitions, we reach E0. All right. So, so why cut? Uh, so, so basically, this state over here has to be an element of the set D. All right. So this follows by definition because this state, this state is reachable from C. So this state is an element of set B, and then we apply the event E. So that by definition, this becomes an element of set D. And given the fact that this state is not bivalent, so this follows from our assumption. And this ultimately leads to E0. So this state has to be D0, which is univalent. So using a similar argument, we can also say that look, if we apply E before reaching E1, then this state over here is D1, which is an element of D. See, if I look at both these cases, what will they essentially tell us? What they will essentially tell us is that either there is a path from D0 to E0, it does not matter, or there is a path from E0 to D0, right? So, one of these is true. Similarly, there is a path from D1 to E1 or from E1 to D1, right? Which is fine, but then what is the key conclusion? Why did we do all of this? So again, this is the last piece of real estate that I will use on this slide. The reason that we did all of this is to say is to prove something very simple. What we proved is that D contains, okay, both zero valent and one valent configuration. That is what we were able to prove that the set D it contains both zero valent as well as one valent configurations. And why and how are we able to prove that? So let me again go back. So we said that look state C is bivalent. It, it, this means that two states E0 and E1 would be reachable from C where E0 decides 0 and E1 decides 1. So from our definition, let us we took two cases. So let us assume that to reach E0, we did not apply E. Then there is a state D0 in D and a state D1 in D where D0 decides 0 and D1 decides 1. And then we looked at the other case and let us say we apply D to come to E0. Then also there are two states in D, right, uh, where uh, one state decide is 0 valent and one state is 1 valent. So this means that D contains both 0 valent and 1 valent configurations, right. It is not the case, even though D we are assuming does not contain a bivalent configuration, it is not the case that D contains only 0 valent configurations or only 1 valent configurations, it contains both. This is what we are able to prove. Now what we are going to do is we will play the same trick that we played in lemma 2 where we are saying that look we have this set D. right? So from C we have come to this set D by applying event E basically and this contains two kinds of configurations. One kind are 0 valent and another kind are 1 valent. All right. So this is where we stand. So now let us do one thing. Let us consider two configurations C0 and C1, both an element of the set 
B. So recall that what is a set B? It is a set of all the configurations that are reachable from C without applying event T. Furthermore, it is possible to prove the same way as we did in lemma 2 that C0 and C1 are essentially one step away and all right, so, so they are essentially one step away and, and furthermore, the step D0 comes from applying E to C0 and the step D1 comes by applying E to C1. So, so let me rephrase this. We are saying a lot of things. This is complicated. So, I will say this again. So, what was the set B? The set B was essentially a set of all the configurations that are reachable from set from configuration C without applying event T. No problem. Then when I apply event B, I come to a much bigger set. So let's say this is the set and th this is set D and set D basically every single point within set D is generated by taking a point from within set B and applying event T. All right. And what we were just able to prove that set D contains both zero valent and one valent configurations and by our assumption, we are saying it doesn't contain a bivalent configuration. All right. So now what I'm saying is that there will definitely be two events, sorry, two configurations C0 and C1 such that they lead to D0 and D1 after applying event B, after applying event D, where D0 decides 0 and D1 decides 1. So that has to be the case because given the fact that we have D0 and D1, they will have images in set B and these would have been created by apply, applying event B. So this follows by definition. So there is nothing non-obvious over here, okay. But if you look at all the states in set B, you will definitely arrive at one such pair where this relationship holds that C1 is equal to, C1 is just one step away from C0, okay. So this is similar to lemma 2 where we said that look, if we consider all the configurations, there definitely one point will arrive, where two configurations are essentially one step away, one decides 0, one decides 1. In this case, of course, C0 and C1, it's not the case that C0 decides 0. But C0 after applying an event goes to D0 which decides 0 and C1 decides and, and D1 decides 1. But the point is that by lemma 2, uh, well let us say by a reasoning similar to lemma 2, we can argue that look we have a large number of events and all of them are essentially reachable from C via a large number of paths. All right. So then if I look at it, so let us see if I, if let us say this is C1 and I just look at it, I go back, back, back all the way up till C. So there will definitely be one event where there is a boundary in the sense that it is one step away where its images in D, uh, one decides 0 and one of course decides 1 because all the states in D are univalent and there will be a, at least one such event pair which are one step away where C0 would lead to D0 and C1 would lead to D1. So let us assume that this is what they are called and the and the single step is essentially the event E dash which we are representing as P dash and M dash. So given that we have been able to prove this, we will look now look at two cases and look at and see what happens. So Recall that we are looking at two events over here. We are looking at event E and event E dash. So event E applies to process P and E dash applies to uh, the transition that uh, E dash applies to process P dash which leads to the transition from C0 to C1. So the case, uh, case 1 which is kind of simple is that P dash is not equal to P. So if P dash is not equal to P, so then what does this mean? So what this means is that we should draw another simple diagram and a simple diagram would look like this that we had states C0 
from there we apply e dash so we come to configuration c1 then what we know is that from c0 we apply event e so we come to d0 and similarly from here we apply event e and we come to d1 all right so now here is the fun part given that e and e dash they are disjoint right so e is working on process p and e dash is working on process p dash so by lemma 1 commutativity would hold because the process sets are disjoint which basically means that if i apply e dash to d0 then i should be able to come to d1 right and herein lies a contradiction because any transition from a zero valence state will never take us to a one valence state but it this appears to be happening given the fact that this appears to be happening this is a contradiction and this is not possible okay so we clearly have a contradiction over here and this is definitely not possible so if this is not possible right what we shall do is we shall consider the other case in which which is case 2 where p is equal to p dash right so in the other case when p is equal to p dash let me write it over here okay so again let us draw a few diagrams so we have c0 so we apply e dash to it we come to c1 okay then we apply e to it so we come to d1 similarly what i know is that i apply e to c0 and i come to d0 so so this is the information that i have and furthermore i know that both e and e dash are actually working on the same process all right so let us do one thing so this is where again the notion of our faulty process will come in so let us consider a run a run sigma where p does not take any steps so as i said a faulty process betrays us at the right time so let us assume that p does not take any steps okay and so let us consider one such run okay so in this run given that p does not take any runs so let this be a deciding run because the point is that we don't know for how long p is not going to take steps and since we have assumed that our system is totally correct so every so basically from every state we should have a we should have an admissible and deciding run so let us assume that we have one such deciding run where p is not taking any steps so p is the faulty process in this case and it has betrayed us so in this case we will apply the transition sigma where p is not taking any steps and so let us say that we arrive at state a all right so given the fact that we arrive at state a so now things appear to be possibly under our control so let us now apply event e to state a so then if we do that we will reach some state but here is the fun part e and sigma are mutually disjoint so which basically means in e only process p takes steps and in sigma process p does not take any steps so they are mutually disjoint so nothing stops us from applying sigma to d0 as well and if we do that given that d0 is univalent the state here will also be univalent all right and so so basically this state will be e0 so no problem let us do the same thing on the other side so let us first apply e dash okay and then let us apply e so if i apply e dash and e in quick succession then i will arrive at one state and this state let us call it e1 the reason is like this that e dash and e are again on the same process p but process p is not there in sigma so nothing stops us from applying sigma to d1 
and with that we arrive at state e1 and e1 has to be one valent because d1 is one valent and uh, as you can see by lemma 1 this construction is allowed so just take a look at this once again what we have done is that sigma as far as we are concerned is an admissible decidable run and this exists because we have assumed that our protocol is totally correct and from every configuration an, an admissible deciding run exists all right so then the thing is that if that is the case then we can do this construction and what we see is that from state a we can reach a zero valence state and we can reach a one valence state this means that state a is bivalent and right so this means that state a is bivalent but this is not possible since the run to a is deciding so since sigma is a deciding run a cannot be a bivalent state Consequently, we have a contradiction over here because this goes against our assumptions. So, given the fact that this goes against our assumptions, lemma 3 as we have written that stands proven where we said that D also contains a bivalent configuration. All right, because we looked at two cases and the two cases are over here, one case is over here and one case is over here. In both the cases, we arrived at a contradiction. So, this essentially means that as per lemma 3, D contains a bivalent config configuration. All right. So, now we are almost done. There is nothing much that we need to do other than spend some amount of time on the next slide. So, here what did we do? We, we said that look at the beginning you will have a bivalent configuration. So, think of this as the base case of the induction. Then we said that let us say if we consider an event T which is applied to process P. So, what you do is that you drain the rest of the events that you have, you will reach a large number of states. From here then again you apply E. So, again it is possible to reach a bivalent configuration and you just keep on doing that. You keep on take, keep on applying events. You will keep on reaching bivalent configurations the way that we have shown. So it is possible that you keep on applying events and keep doing so infinitely, and you will still be reaching bivalent configurations in the sense you will still not be able to make a decision. So this means that your consensus will not happen because your protocol is indecisive, and this basically means that you will simply not arrive at a state at a configuration where a decision has been made. So, this pretty much proves the theorem. So, what is the implication of the theorem? The implication of the theorem basically means that whenever I want to do any kind of a, solve any kind of a distributed algorithm. So, it turns out that most distributed algorithms can be mapped to some or other kind of a consensus problem, some or other kind of an agreement problem. Right, so it might not be able to efficiently map, but it can be mapped to a consensus problem. And given the fact that this consensus problem cannot be solved, right, even with one faulty process, this means that if we consider faults in our system, our system will be severely challenged. Right, so it is simply not possible to arrive at any form of agreement, even if one single process is faulty. And this to us represents a significant issue. So, we will keep this in mind. We will keep referring to this as FLP result. So, we will keep this in mind. And subsequently, we will discuss a host of consensus protocols. So, we will discuss Paxos in later slides of the lecture set. We will discuss Raft. In all of them, we will say that look, yes, we know this result. It basically means that we will not be able to achieve consensus all the time but at least let us aim to do this most of the time that most of the time let us try to achieve some degree of consensus and otherwise let us rely on some form of timeout mechanisms and some form of timers because in the real world nothing is really indefinite i mean it can be one second to one hour to one day but with some additional timing mechanism we can do better right so nothing is 
theoretically asynchronous. So, but of course, the FLP result kinds of gives us a hard lower bound of what is doable or rather what is not doable. 